Pandemic. Good evening. Welcome to Pandemic. I'm Joel Silverman. I am absolutely thrilled tonight to have Deborah Pratt with me. She created one of my favorite shows growing up called Quantum Leap. If you are too, I don't know, I don't want to say too young to have seen it. If you're too young to have grown up with it being a part of the constant conversation around you, then you need to go back and pull it up immediately or at least immediately after this program is finished. And uh, more recently, Deborah directed a, uh, a major episode of Grey's Anatomy, which is a show that a few people I think have seen, and uh, also uh, holds the distinction of being the first black drama EP in 1989, which is more recently than one might think or hope that that would be the case, but she shattered that ceiling and now is uh, kind of a part of Hollywood royalty, though I don't think that she would describe herself that way, but I think it's fair enough to say. Before we get to that interview, though, I do want to uh, pick up uh, a quick thank you to our sponsors, to Roadmap Writers and to Notes for Execs. Roadmap Writers is an online writer education platform hosted by working industry executives. If you're looking for a real-world solution to help develop, market, and sell your script, visit RoadmapWriters.com to learn more. Notes for Execs is a company that guides working entertainment executives on how to give better and more effective creative notes. Now they're opening their doors to writers as well who can learn a lot about their own writing through learning about the notes giving process. Visit NotesForExecs.com to learn more. And with that, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome to the stream, Deborah Pratt. Hey. Hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I am doing okay. Uh, I am told that I am really quiet in the audio stream. So I'm going to turn up my volume a little bit and see if that makes things any better. Yeah, because I turned up mine as high as it would go. So. Okay. And uh, so those out there watching, let me know how I sound to you, if this is a little bit better. Uh, Paul, I know that I can always rely on you. Paul is one of our regular viewers. And Hi, Paul. This is going to be absolutely thrilling for the podcast version when people are just waiting for it to work itself out. You can fast forward through the next 10 to 30 seconds on the podcast version. Uh, I think, uh, I think that we're good. I think that maybe the intro song was just a little bit loud. Uh, I'm told by Bruna that the sound is great. Bruna, let us know where you're watching from. Uh, I know that, uh, we have people who watch from, okay, Paul says Deborah sounds great. Well, then I think that we're ready to start a live show. I've got a few messages coming in that say I'm fine. So great. That's all we need to know. Uh, so Deborah, now that we have the fun tech things out of the way, um, I often like to start a little bit, uh, like at the end of the story and start with what you're up to now, or at least what you were up to right before the pan the pandemic struck. Uh, I know that you just directed an episode of Grey's Anatomy and then uh, can rewind and start at the beginning and get the, how did you end up here? <laughs> so, uh, so tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the Grey's Anatomy thing. It was an amazing experience. Uh, I can't think of a nicer cast and crew and I got to give big preps to, uh, props to Debbie Allen for, um, uh, you know, bringing me into the world and I got to hang out for a couple of episodes just to meet people. So I was really comfortable with everybody. And, um, and I went to prep the show and we were about three days into my prep and they came to me and said, okay, two of the actors are sick. And so you're going to start on Thursday. And I went, wait, I haven't had a production meeting yet. And they went, yeah, we know. Okay. So here are the scenes that you're going to do on Thursday. And I went, okay. And um, so I didn't have a chance to be nervous. It's a huge show. I mean, 16 years. And, and because of the, the pandemic, because of COVID, uh, it ended up being the season finale for season 16. 
Well, I so, knew I wasn't sure whether to, I was about. I said when I introduced it, a big episode. I wasn't sure if I could properly refer to it as the finale. Uh, it's what it is. It's the season sixteen finale, um, and I'm really proud of it. It was, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was like doing a thirty million dollar movie because they have all the toys, all the toys, <laughs> and I, I, um, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I remember the scene we shot where the ambulance pulls in and everything, and I was trying to do it because they have, you know, green screens. And I had, I was lucky enough when they, I saw the script, they had a time lapse sequence that had to be done with green screen. And I, and I, I put my producer's hat on. I said, oh, I can save them some money and I'll just shoot like that. And uh, Debbie Allen came out and went, here's a 35 foot crane. Don't you want to use that? And I went, yeah. And so she said, then go for it. So. It's fun to have out. unlimited money. Huh? It's fun on a production to have unlimited money. It must be. I have not been there until Grey's Anatomy. And the actors were amazing. I mean, there's just such a, a grace on the set. And, and Vanessa, the executive producer, and I got to always give props to Shonda Rhimes for just creating this show that has evolved and, and lived on through these characters. So, and I was a fan. Um, for a very long time, it was my mom's favorite show, so I was really excited to do it for her because I don't think she had ever missed an episode. And um, sadly, she we lost her um, last year, so she didn't get. She had to watch it in heaven, as they say. Um, well, but it was a blast. It was really a blast. And that's so cool too to be thrown into. Ah, oh, this is from Bruna in, in Brazil. We stand one talented woman. Thank you, uh, and and watching. We got Stephanie Jordan watching from Houston, Texas. This is fun. This is, uh, <laughs> I guess this is what it feels like to make a TV show. Uh, it is really neat to jump into something like Ray's Anatomy, where this machine has now been going for so long, and to then just get to put your little spin of English on it when you're directing a show that has had hundreds of episodes before how do you make your how do you make your mark on it how do you approach that that you bring in some of your authorial voice um well because we had to jump in that first day uh, what was very important to me was to be on time and be and finish in the day on time so my first shot you know and they again they're not going to let you fail because they have uh, the the producer writers on the set with you to talk to you about character and any questions that you might have. Um, it, it's just really a brilliantly done show that way. And so I came out and I said, everybody, I'm going to do this shot in a winner. And it's the scene where I don't want to, you know, give anything away that anybody hasn't seen it, but one of the lead characters is in the bed. He's still unconscious from the surgery. The family is around him and somebody comes in to see how he is. So I started the camera um, facing the door and then moved around for the dialogue, picked her up. She went in there. I came back around and ended on everyone's back looking at this central character. We did the take three times. I said, everybody got it? Camera? Sound? The actors were okay? I went, Great, we're moving on. And then all of a sudden, like, people came out of nowhere and they went, wait, 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 where's the coverage? And I went, what's a wonder? So it's a wonder. <laughs> I said, did you like it? It's beautiful. I said, then moving on. So I think that kind of set the tone that, and I had all this great equipment to pay with. And then if you watch the show, there's an homage to Quantum Leap, which is a mirror shot in the, um, in the second to the last scene, where we're very close on one of the characters' faces, and I do a slow, slow pullback over her shoulder to reveal that she's looking at herself in the mirror, she turns and then walks away. So there were about five places through there that, um, oh, oh, and my favorite one was this terrible event happens and this doctor has to go and listen to the fact that his wife is cheating on him, the wife to be is cheating on him. And so I said to uh, her, Davis, the DP, 
um, I want to do this like it's a 40s movie. I want it black, black with streaks of really white light. And he sits down through these lights and we're going to shoot through, you know, it's going to be in a storage cabin. And everybody looked at me like I was crazy for a minute. <laughs> and then we did it and it was just, I thought, very powerful and very moving. And then the, the time-lapse shot, I don't know if you know anything about time-lapse photography, but it takes about, I don't know, 20 minutes to shoot 12 seconds of film. Right. So I had the stars of this show that I had to choreograph all of them doing specific things at specific times. And if you walked into my prep office, I know people thought, oh my God, it's a scene out of a beautiful mind. There were green lines where X's where people would stop and they had letters on them where people would come in. And there was like all these lines that went everywhere. But I knew exactly what I was gonna tell people to do. And the, and the cast was amazing. Everybody did it to a T. If you look at that opening, it's set up too that two of the actors are in real time. Then I think 12 of the actors are in high speed photography um, in, in time-lapse photography. And then outside the window, day is going to night and then back to day. And then, um, I guess it goes to day. Yeah. It goes to night, to day, to night. So I had to, to coordinate all that. And I didn't sleep for like three days, just trying to make sure all the pieces fit before we even shot a frame. And those were the kind of things that I think felt very signature um, and a couple of other ones that, you know, I believe felt cinem cinematic. And at the same time, I really worked hard to keep that kind of uh, walk and talk scene that the show is so famous for um, in there a number of times and still be clever with the camera if you know cinematography, some French overs, and I got a little fancy. No, I had a great time. Well, I love the the setup with the one -er and everybody watching and saying, well, what about the coverage? And you saying, no, we don't need it. It's fine. It's a one -er. We're moving on. Mm -hmm. Because there's two things to that. One is that I think that a lot of times now, especially on shows that have higher budgets, people just get kind of pampered. And like I hear about... Uh, a friend of mine was working on a show with Jonathan Frakes who came up on Star Trek The Next Generation and they call him Two Takes Frakes because folks that were making TV in the 90s when there were lower budgets and less time, it was like, yeah, we got it. It's fine. We're moving on. Are you sure? What if we have like 15 other angles that we have just in case? No, we're moving on. It's fine. And I think that that's a, a talent that probably a lot of newer directors could acquire but have been conditioned not to use to just shoot it and say it's good we're moving on i did a film for the um bbc pbs and the bbc did <clears throat> you know masterpiece theater and it was the first time they ever did american literature so mm -hmm. he's called cora unashamed based on a short story um and we had 21 days to shoot it. It was on location. And my goal was, how many, how many wonders can I do? Now, the beauty of wonders is, unless you shoot coverage, you can't cut into them. <laughs> so you better be ready. But I had these amazing theatrical actors, which is why the West Wing was so good. These people were trained theater people. So you could, you could they would know their lines, you could give them the choreography so they could really dance with the camera. And, um, and we got to do that a, a number of times with some, some pretty intricate shots. And you wanted to get them in two or three takes because you still had time. But I had saved so much time doing it that way that I was able to tell more of the story. So, Well, I think that there's also something where especially now because the audience is hip to the fact that you can edit anything together and that you can do anything digitally and you can you can add in a whole landscape behind them or whatever if you're seeing a wonder and it's and it's properly executed it you know that they're not faking you 
in any kind of way. You yeah. Know, this is an actual performance. This is an actual piece of cinema that's happening in front of you. And there's no, there's no funny stuff happening. Which show did I just recently get into? Oh, the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? Mm -hmm. They do some of the most phenomenal musical wonders I think I've seen in years. It was like, in a way, watching old Hollywood you know, movies, which I'm a huge fan of Buzz B. Berkeley and all the big musicals with <clears throat> Gower Champion and then Gene Kelly, who, by the way, I danced with when I first came out here. Really? Yes, it's true. I danced with Debbie Reynolds, Gene Kelly, and Donald O'Connor, all at different times, because I came out here as like a singer-dancer, jumping back through time really quickly. Um, well, I, I, I like jumping back through time. That's a, <laughs> that's a conceit we use here often, and it's all the more appropriate with you uh, as the, the co-creator of one of the greatest time travel shows. I would actually argue the greatest time travel show uh in in the history of television if yes so, I can agree with that. <laughs> well so so let's do like a long tracking shot across a mirror and jump back in time to you i guess right before you first came out here and danced with gene kelly and these other famous people yeah uh, it was your first job out here um i i was born in a small town called chicago Raised with uh, my three sisters, whose names all begin with D, Diane, Donna, and Deirdre. Um, went to the Academy of Our Lady School for Girls, very Catholic, and survived that. Spent summers in Louisiana. And for all my relatives down there, on both sides of the family, um, I say hello to Bryans and the Averys. <clears throat> and if you know Baton Rouge, uh, you know that Avery Island is, uh, <clears throat> is an area, beautiful botanical gardens, but it's also where Tabasco comes from. Hmm. So there's a whole interesting legacy there. And then when I graduated college, and I graduated early because I was in a hurry, um, I was supposed to get a degree degree in psychology and then ended up going into theater and discovered I could sing and dance and all these things that my parents went, no, 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 you're supposed to be a professional. That's not professional <laughs> entertainment. You didn't know that you could sing and dance before you got to college? Well, not really. I mean, I had, I think the first time I sang, my mother told me <clears throat> she came to the Christmas play and she opened the program and it said, and Deborah Pratt solo. And she said, I, I didn't know you could sing because <laughs> I never sang around the house, but I had just kind of really freaky soprano voice. I had three and a half octaves. Hmm. And, um, and that was a, at a very early age. But again, I had no show business family or anything. So it was not, I didn't go to voice lessons or anything like that. So when I went off to college, I thought, oh, well, I'll do a minor in, in music and theater because I really liked it. And I'd done a couple of plays. And every time I auditioned for Marat Sa or Tea House of the August Moon or I can't remember what the other one was, I got the lead. And I thought, oh, I must be really good. <laughs> and that was a great experience. And, um, and so then they, uh, the school I went to was Webster University, which is a wonderful school. And they have a... Um, they have a theater company, a repertory theater. So as a, a, a student, I got to, I got to uh, be in the repertory plays as well. And I wrote my first play and that got me into writing. And then um, I graduated and I told my parents I really wanted to take a year off and try show business. And they were very lovely about it and then said, okay, but then you have to go back to school and either get a master's or a doctorate and get a real job. And I auditioned for two traveling Broadway shows. One was um, Godspell. The other was Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And I got 
both of them. I chose Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And I under, I was understudied to everybody. And I did that show for about a month. And then my mother called me and said, oh, these people from Hollywood are coming out and they're having a, an audition. So do you want to go check that out? And I thought, well, I have a job, but sure. Mom said, don't you all, you said you want to do television. And so I went down and it was like American Idol. There were about 500 women and we auditioned all day. And at the end of the day, it was myself and one other woman. And I raised my hand and said, this has been really fun, but I have a job. I have to go to work. And the, the um, executive producer said, don't you understand what we're offering you? I said, well, you haven't offered me anything. You have my address, you have my name and my number. So when you do, we can talk about that. But right now I have to go to work. And he said, where do you get this? And he said, F you attitude. And I said, well, who are you to even ask me that question? I said, call me if you want to offer me a job. And they did. And so I was flown out to California, got the job, and came back and worked with D. Martin on his TV show way back in the day. And played Vegas and got to sing and dance and travel and, and did that for a year. And then uh, decided I should go into acting. I wrote a couple of albums with people and um, tried the music industry, but the music industry and I didn't get along that well at the time. I think it was the 80s, it was just too many drugs, 70s, 80s. And, um, and so I started writing. I started doing TV and, um, and I started writing. And I had a couple of pilots that never went. And then I was doing a series called Airwolf and reoccurring on a series called Magnum PI and asked if I could write an episode of Airwolf. And the executive producer said, sure, go ahead. And it was good. And we ended up, you know, after probably nine rewrites, shooting it. And then I wrote one or two episodes on Magnum PI. And that's kind of what started. And he said, you want to learn how to produce? And I said, yeah. And that's what got me into being behind the camera. And I fell in love with it. I think my music education, my acting education, all kind of serviced my writing and then eventually my producing and directing. And how do you think that they serviced? How did, how did that training and performance and music and those things serve you so well once you started doing writing and directing? Well, as a director, I was an actor, so I knew how to talk to actors. I respected them. I knew how to pull a performance from them, I think. I mean, I was, I felt very blessed, you know, even just recently on Grace, these people are incredibly talented and trusted me to, you know, to guide them in the kind of performances that I felt that the show needed. And again, they, they have their characters, they know their characters, but it, it was, it, it's a leap of faith to, to be able to be trusted. Um, and then once the show is done, especially when I was executive producing on Quantum or The Net or some of the other shows that I've done, to be able to go to a spotting session and understand when music should come in, because I came out of music, hmm. was very, very helpful. Or to go into a scoring stage and, you know, the, say, let's bring strings in here, because I've made albums, so I knew... I knew how to construct that and then where to lay it and where to take it out and how to create themes um, and apply them into the, the to support the image. Um, uh, so, so music was hugely important. And then um, editorial was the big lesson. And I, I give big props to, to Don Belisario for he was a real master at it and that, you know, he could take a show that wasn't working and create a whole new villain through editing, through the editorial process. And so I feel like 
that's one of my superpowers now too. Editing, you mean? Hmm. Editing is one of your superpowers, you said. Yeah. So and once you understand editing, you edit in the camera, so you don't have to shoot. 85 takes of something because you know exactly what you want and how you're going to edit it before you even roll film. So you get what you need. If you don't need that entire master the entire time, you cut out of it when you cut out of it, and then you move on to the, the closer and tighter angle. So that was a gift too. Absolutely. And I think that editing, at least for me, I'm, I would be curious if it's your experience as well, taught me to be a better writer and that I... I now know when I'm writing something and I go, mm, that's not going to make it. That's not going to make it through post. There's no reason for me to bother shooting this thing and taking everybody's time. Like, we just need these three lines. Let's just put that on the page and then move on. And it's made me much, much tighter as a writer. I also think, by the way, it occurs to me when you're talking about music, music, writing, editing, there's a rhythm to all of it. There's a rhythm. I don't have enough experience directing to know, but I know that with music and writing and editing, there's a beat to it. There's an internal just kind of beat that you have to get and feel all the way through the project. Right. No, I agree. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it's it, in a way it's on the page too. You know, you know where a scene starts, you know where a scene ends. Um, those are the things I think that, that time as a writer, as a director, as um, an editor, you you build in those thousands of hours of doing it and doing it and doing it so that you know where the cut falls and you know, you know how to tell the story to get the best impact of the words that the writer has written. It's interesting. I've been doing something lately I, I, I did something I haven't done in quite a few years when the CDRs went out and people weren't burning CDs anymore. I stopped making people mix CDs. Yeah. I always used to make people mixes. And then recently somebody asked me about my taste in music, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. And I said, oh my gosh, I would love to make you a mix. But, you know, nobody uses CDs anymore. And all of a sudden I was making a mix and I was making this mix at the same time that I was outlining a script. And I went, oh, well, what is outlining a script if not kind of making a mix CD of of the of the story? Or it's like, it's like, oh yeah, you want that big opening track, but then you want like a more contemplative beat, and then you want a more. I really feel like it's all variations on the same skill set. Yeah, yeah, I think it is too. I mean, the core, underlying, important element is story. Yeah. And, and who's telling that story? And if those two answers are clear in your mind, everything else kind of falls in place. And when you say who's telling that story, do you mean the writer or who's telling the story? Like whose perspective is, is it from the, from the script? From yeah. the character? Yeah. You know, and I find, I, I find that, and now it's, it's blending in a, in a strange way, but in television, it's very character driven. You have got to fall in love with that character and want to come back every week. You know, in in film, as you know, characters are certainly important, but it's it's the world and the story because you have so much more room and scope to to go out and explore. You know, I think it, it gets lost in too much action and too many special effects these days. But where's the heart of that story that you're telling? Yeah. Uh, I I have been watching. I'm one of the, I believe the official number is seven, seven people that downloaded HBO Max in the first week. Uh, and no offense to HBO Max. I'm actually going to say it's a fantastic service. Uh, I think just they didn't do a good job. Letting, what's that? Why is it a fantastic service? I'm curious. Because of their back catalog. And, oh. and so they've got all the Warner stuff going back a hundred years. And so I've been watching things that I'd heard of, but never seen. Oh, what did you and watch? What did you watch? 
well, now I'm going to be, I'm going to incriminate myself and embarrass myself by saying what I hadn't seen. I'd never seen Casablanca. Heard it was great. Went back and watched it. Obviously, wonderful movie. Uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> uh, which basically is a serial. Like, that is the most episodic movie I've ever seen. Every 15 minutes is a new episode. But it is amazing to see when you strip away some of the effects and some of the stuff that people can do now, you're just left with actors saying words. You're just left with dialogue. And it's it's kind of neat. As a writer, I feel like I've learned more watching some of those old movies, those classic movies, than I have watching, uh, watching a lot of newer stuff because it's just the basics right there in front of you, literally in black and white. I think, too, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um... I'm going to have to go back and rewatch Treasure of Sierra Madre. I haven't seen it in a million years. I, Socially, I it doesn't hold up as well as you might think. It turns out that there are no women with speaking parts. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, other than that. It's only been so in Hollywood for 100 years. Come on. <laughs> You're finally catching up. Uh, you know, and the fact that there were huge women stars, um, in the 20s, women had more power as directors mm -hmm. than probably for the next 80 years or 100 years, and then only recently are, are women coming back out as directors because directors back then were not as important as producers. Right. And then it flipped mm -hmm. in the sense that directors had the big chunk of power along with the big name stars and stuff. Yeah. Um, but there was something I was going to share. Oh, so I went to the American Film Institute hmm. when I left, when I finished Quantum Leap, because I decided I wanted to direct and I really wanted to learn how to direct. And so they have a, they have a program called the Directing Women's Workshop. And it's an, it's an intensive, but you have access to the American Film Institute for a year but you don't have a lot of money to make your movie. And Sony, you know, gives you a small amount of money and cameras and then AFI gives you everything else. But what I found, which was kind of cool, was um, AFI has a, is a great calling card, you know, and basically the name of the film was called um, uh, Girlfriends, but the, the title of the production company was called Calling In All Favor Productions. So I knew somebody at Disney and I said, I need your back lot and I don't have any money. Is there any days that it's just available that we could come on and shoot? And, you know, and I've got insurance through the American Film Institute. They went, oh, the American Film Institute, okay. So I got costumes from Universal and, you know, I like literally called in anybody that I knew to give me a favor. Um, we shot at all over the Disney ranch in Burbank and, um, and I made it look like a movie. And I remember I didn't have a crane. So I said to the cameraman, how brave are you? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I want this big Vista shot. So if I had had a crane or even a cherry picker, I could have gotten it. I said, but we have this 12 foot ladder that we're gonna strap onto the top of the camera truck. And if you feel comfortable, you don't have to. <laughs> and he went, oh, okay. And he went and got this amazing cinemascope, you know, shot for me of these two girls running across a field and stuff like that. And I just needed one to give it scope, but it really made it look like a bigger production for the movie. And, what that inspired me was to go back and look at early movies to see when they had nothing, mm -hmm. how they created this stuff. That's where that would be fun. That's what I was getting back to your Warner Brothers access through HBO Max. And I didn't know that's what they had in their, hidden in their pocket. You know, and Disney has all that old stuff. Right. Some of which I think that they would prefer people forget, but still. Yeah. yeah. So when you had the guy, the camera guy up on that ladder, why didn't you just have him use a drone? 
There were no drones back then. What are you talking I, about? I, I was, was joking. I was joking with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had no drones. That was good. That was good deadpan, though. It was a good deadpan. <laughs> yeah. No, there were no drones. This was 1997. At least if there were drones, I didn't know about it. For those shots, we used helicopters. Yes. Uh, and and there were no drones. Uh, that I can say with uh, with confidence. Uh, I want to now that we're kind of in the in the '90s period of your life. I want to ask about Quantum Leap, but before I do, I do want to do a quick sponsorship break. So I'm gonna go and quickly pay the bills, and then uh, I'll come right back and talk about the development of one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. Uh, so. There we go. This episode of Pandemic is brought to you by Roadmap Writers and Notes for Execs. Look at those banners on the screen. Remember this time, always 50-50. Roadmap is a screenwriting education platform for writers looking for a guided path to success. Programs are hosted online by working industry executives and are designed to empower writers with actionable tools to elevate their craft and cultivate industry relationships. Since 2016, Roadmap has helped more than 118 Ding! 119 writers and counting signed to representation, including a bunch of friends of mine, and many others get staffed, optioned, or sell their scripts. To learn more, visit RoadmapWriters.com and use the code PANDEMIC to save $15. Roadmap Writers, the road to your screenwriting success starts here. Notes for Execs is a company that guides working entertainment executives on how to give better and more effective creative notes. Now they're opening their doors to writers as well who can learn a lot about their own writing through learning about the notes giving process. Visit notesforexecs.com for more information. And now I'll move these away and return to Deborah Pratt. Uh, and so, Deborah, uh, tell me. You did a very good job, by the way. What's that? I said you did a very good job, by the way. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> if you. If you go back and watch some of the earlier episodes, which I'm not necessarily endorsing, you can see me like really shaking around doing this and feeling very uneasy as I go back and forth to guests and sponsorships and stuff. But now I kind of got a sense and a little bit of a rhythm. I almost feel like I'm a little... show? Just since the pandemic started. So, wow. yeah, just since the beginning of April and uh, asked a few friends to come on and uh and it's it's just kind of grown and we got a sponsorship offer and then another one and uh yeah and tasha messages she says uh actually we've been on for ages it's been years just because that's how long it feels. <laughs> it that way. yeah uh it's like when i messaged you and i said yeah we're gonna be on may like i'd love to have you on for may 15th and you said think june Right. Yeah. May, June, whatever it is. Um, Everybody says we've lost time. Yeah. And it's it's interesting. I was watching, doing some research, and I watched a, a film that I hadn't seen in a long time called Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. Oh, yeah. Luc Besson directed it. Uh, you know, it has that kind of French flair to it, but they talk about time and how we as humans invented time mm -hmm. and how we rely on it to function. I, and I thought it was a really interesting um, conversation that she was having about when we don't have time, we get lost. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Because people are at home and days go by and suddenly it's weeks go by and you seem to forget what month it is, what day it is. Well, I also, I think that it ends up really negatively impacting people emotionally because the one of the key ways, maybe the biggest way I feel that people measure time is not in hours and minutes and days, but in the emotional distance between two points. And so that's why when something really significant has happened, it feels like, Oh my God, that was my life before that big significant thing that feels like it was years ago, even if it was only a few weeks or you meet somebody new and all of a sudden you're in love and it's like, wow, 
You know, it feels like I've known this person my whole life. And it's like, right, you've had a huge emotional journey over this very confined period of time. Right, right. And I think that when people are all locked inside and the days run into one another and one seems like the next, it prevents the ability to move emotionally from one thing to another. And our emotional states just get, it's like the gears wind down because we can't go from one emotional place to another as I think we need to. Yeah, and we're also being incredibly bombarded uh, with a reality that has been here for a long time that is suddenly in our faces in a way that it needs to be. It's on a, it's on a global level and mm -hmm. masses are reacting together and there's this coming together that I think is incredibly powerful. I've always believed that, you know, uh, collective consciousness is what will evolve the planet. And we've really been held back, caught up in these intensely focused day by day by day by minute by minute, second by second um, lives that we're living. And suddenly you have time to, to step back and really experience what's happening. And I think that's what is so powerful about the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and it might finally bring change. Uh, it, it's still going to be a hard fight. I yeah. was telling someone that my great, great uncle, Oscar de Priest, was a congressman in 1919. And he wow. put a bill, or he was with a group of people that put a bill that had been on the floor for already maybe 20 years, um, which was the anti-lynching laws. And he couldn't get it passed and he couldn't get it passed and he couldn't get it passed. And I'm like reading in the paper and it said, Congress just passed the anti-lynching law. And I went, oh, it only took 120 years. And what I didn't realize was that it still had to go to the Senate and it still had to go to the president. Yeah. And so I had posted, oh, yay, we did it, we did it. And then saw that while everybody was out talking about the the murder of George Floyd with somebody on his neck, which to me is just lynching without a rope in a tree. Senate is arguing about, well, should we do this? And should we include transgender people? And I'm going, what? Yeah. Please go away, all you people. Just stop being representatives because you're not representatives of the people of this country. So well, that's the thing. We've only had representative democracy in this country for a very short period of time. And in some states at this point, we don't have it really at the, because we people don't. aren't able to properly vote. We don't. That's all gotta change. And right now those voices, our voices have got to be heard. And if people were saying, you know, you're doing too much, you're out here, you're too aggressive, you're too violent. Well, that's because for a hundred and, you know, 120 years you weren't listening so maybe Longer than that really shout, well yeah very much so shout a little louder for 400 years well what's amazing i think the thing that makes all of this possible to me is social media and the ability for people not only to take the video in the first place but then to share it and if the gatekeepers and media don't want people to see it for it to get out anyway and then for people to organize around it, I mean, Black Lives Matter started as a hashtag on Twitter right. and then builds into a movement. And then first, it's mostly African-Americans in the street and who are saying Black Lives Matter. And then you see over the course of the last six years, it breaks into white consciousness, breaks in, breaks in. And then all of a sudden, over the course of the last few weeks, you, you ask people, do you agree Black Lives Matter? Yes, through the roof. And you see these protests, you know, I'm, I'm right next to Hollywood Boulevard. You see these protests and it's, there's actually probably in this area more white people. And that is a collective, I don't know if the term is collective unconscious, but it's a, it's a shared consciousness that I think is only possible with billions of little interactions of people, those little synapses connecting, connecting. through social media. Yeah, I agree. And it can't stop. Right now, we've got the momentum going, and people are, you know, a lot of whites are going, I, I knew it, but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. I didn't, 
And to watch someone be murdered on camera for eight minutes and 46 seconds is horrifying. Yeah. And it's something you can never unsee. And the fact that, you know, it's still happening, it just happened twice last week. The hanging here in Palmdale is like, seriously? Mm -hmm. And the guy and the man in Atlanta who was shot, and I apologize, I, I can't remember his name. Um, it's just. Well, it's also, you see how people behave when the cameras are on. And you go, wait a minute. You know the eyes of the world are watching you and you're behaving yeah. this way. How would you behave if nobody was watching? Because there's no accountability. They still don't care. And that's why the laws have got to change. The fact that so for so long these police have committed these crimes because nobody's going to put them in jail. The unions protect them. And, and I also believe that police are, are doing jobs they shouldn't be doing. When Reagan took out the, when Reagan took out the um, the mental health care in this country, suddenly it fell to the police to go handle people that were bipolar and on the streets talking to themselves and family, you know, uh, disturbances and, and family abuses. Mm -hmm. and that's to me isn't their job. Right. They shouldn't even be given traffic tickets as far as I'm concerned, unless somebody's like going 120 miles per hour and endangering other people's lives. But truthfully, take a picture of somebody's license and send it in and arrest them or give them a ticket. You don't have to go pull them out of a car and put, your, put yourself in danger to give somebody a ticket. Just take a picture and give them a ticket. It's gotta change. I mean, I, I remember a, a moment when I was in college and uh, because of my major, I majored in American studies and I was often one of the only white people in my class. And we were talking about uh, just, I don't remember exactly what prompted the conversation, but at that point I was probably about 21 years old. I've been driving for about five years and somebody talked about being pulled over and they asked, well, what's your experience of being pulled over? They asked me and I went, I've never been pulled over. And they went, what? Everybody in the class was just shocked. They asked it as if not like, have you been or how many times it was just like, what's your experience of this thing that we all experience, like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom. And it's like, oh no, that's not a thing for me. I have subsequently been pulled over, but I definitely deserved it. I was speeding. Uh, admittedly, it was in Montana, like, give me a break. Uh, the first time that I got pulled over, I was speeding, uh, and uh, I am a little bit proud of that because, in theory, Montana doesn't have speed limits. Turns out that technically they do, uh -huh. uh, but yeah, and that's something that I think a lot of people, uh, particularly a lot of white people, are having those kinds of realization moments that their experience is just a little bit different or more than a little bit. Right. That whole level of... <clears throat> you know, white privilege. And there are a lot of people that don't have privilege. They just have it better. Yeah. It may not be privileged, but it's still better than having a gun put in your face or be dragged out of a car or be shot just because of the color of your skin. And I'm so grateful that they're acknowledging the fact that these facial recognition cameras, they don't work on people of color, period. Yeah. So no, you can't use them. Yeah. You get it. You're getting um, it. Slow. So what was your quantum leap show? Well, actually, uh, you know, so th this is a, a good segue because, uh, and I'll, I'll couch it in a question from the audience too, from Mike Rinaldi here, one of our regular viewers who says, how did you view quantum leaps opportunity to examine American society across decades? One of my favorite episodes of quantum leap as a kid was when Sam, who is Scott Bakula, a uh, white guy, ends up living the experience of a black man in the 19, I believe it was the 1950s. It's been a while. And yeah, and I remember I saw that. I was young and it was both educational to me in terms of what somebody's experience would be and also as a storytelling conceit 
I remember being like, wow, what a cool idea that somebody could have, not that I was thinking in these terms, but like could literally be put into somebody else's shoes and have that experience. It, it really was one of those moments of like, wow, this, this is so cool. I mean, you bear in mind, I'm talking, I'm like eight years old here, but it, eight or nine, but it, like, it touched, really, that's it touched it, me. And it's yeah. what I, re, I remember, th truly, I remember three episodes now. It's been a really long time. And I remember the finale of the first season when Al, I think it's Al, Dean Stockwell, sees his wife. Yeah, good show. And then who who he's lost and he gets to see her again. And then I remember uh the that episode where Sam becomes a black man in the fifties. And I remember the uh the series finale, which calls back to the season one finale, but I won't give away, and the final the final crawl saying Sam never got home. Or Sam never, Sam never went home. Still out there. He's still out there. Sorry, he's still out there. Yeah. Um, that was a big fight. I fought yeah. for him to not come home. I blame really? myself. Yes, I wanted it that way for for two reasons. One, I think if he came home, it would be the end of the series. And two, so many people loved that he helped people, and he made better what. You know, he made right what was once wrong. And so when the show was suddenly canceled, I said, don't bring him home. And um, I said, leave him out there to be a ray of hope. And so we can come back and do a movie <laughs> or another TV show. And then I wrote, I wrote that episode where Sam Le leapt in to a black man. And, and I'll tell you two interesting stories. When I pitched it, I had seen Before, Deborah, if I could stop you for just a second. Oh. Because I just want to contextualize for those who haven't seen the show that the premise is that Sam, Scott Bakula, gets transported into the bodies of people in the past and lives their life and writes some historical wrong that they experienced. And then once he does, he hops into the body of somebody else. And we see him as Scott Bakula. But when we see him in the mirror, we see what everybody else around him sees. And that may be a black man in the 50s, or it might be something else. Uh, I also remember he invented the Heimlich maneuver. I do remember that. Uh, somebody goes, Mr. Heimlich. Right. <laughs> yeah. He goes and saves somebody. It literally just popped into my head just this second that he saved somebody. And somebody goes, thank you, Dr. Heimlich. What? <laughs> Those are what we call kisses with history. Yes. And they're very hard to do, but we would put those in. And they were usually humorous, but not always. Where exactly something like that. I think the funny, my, one of my favorite ones was he, turned, he, he leapt into a, a veterinarian in this very rural town. And there was a kid who, who worked for him. And he was always strumming on the guitar, playing songs and through the whole episode. You know, he's trying to write this song. He's trying to write this song about this little pig named Sue. And he gets to the end of the show and he thinks he's done what Al says you're here to do and he doesn't leave. And the guy sitting next to him, whose name he doesn't know, is singing Piggy Sue, Piggy Sue. And he's stuck on it. He's stuck on it. He's stuck on it. And Sam turns around and says, oh, now I can't think of the, the uh, singer's name. And he says, try Peggy. And as soon as he sings Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, Sam leaps. So that was our kiss with history. That's a great bit. I love that. Uh, and uh, if, you, I mean, if you're really a fan, you can find that. Um, oh, but I was going to tell you a really moving story. When, please, please. When I wrote... Um, the first time Sam leapt into a black man, that first season, everybody went, no, 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 that's season three. That we, we're not going to do anything out of the ordinary. And I went, no. And I was very grateful to Brandon Tartikoff, who supported me and said, yeah, let her do it. And so 
um, I had been reading this Time magazine or Life magazine, and it had a picture on the cover of a black man sitting alone in the kitchen eating, and the woman that he drove for sitting alone in the dining room eating by herself. And then these two people that they were in the South, they could not eat together. And that was really the inspiration for the idea. So I wrote the show and we aired it. And I'll never forget, we got insane amounts of calls, but one of them or one of the letters was from a teacher and she had taped the show, because back then it was VHSs, and she brought it to class and she played it for her fourth graders, I think, which would have been your age, about your age. And she played it up to the point where Sam walks into the, to the diner, sits down, and looks up and sees that he's a black man. And she freezes it. And she says to them, what do you think happens next? And they went, well, I don't know, you know, he, uh, he orders his lunch and, and then he, you know, goes on with his life. And then she hit play again and everybody reacts and he gets kicked out and the, she said the kids were furious why would they do that to him and i and i and she said i realized what a great teaching moment it was in the fact that it's 1980 you know 80 uh i guess it was 88 and people have not had to deal with the, the in-your-face racism of uh, segregation and she said it, it made a phenomenal uh opportunity to talk to them about history that's not in our history books right which goes back to everything that we're talking about now all the incredible stories of that struggle and strife from you know from 1619 to today right so it so to answer i don't remember the gentleman's name that asked the question that was to me when I came up with the show. I wanted the opportunity. I that season, Sam leapt into a woman, and I dealt yes. with sexism. Yep. Um, he leapt into uh, a, a black man, and I think we did one other show. Um, you know, and I had him leap into a black woman. I mean, the beauty of the show was you could tell any story, and Sam uh, Scott Bakula was so amazingly. <laughs> He would go for it. He would absolutely go for it. And and I think that was really important. We were very blessed to have both Dean Stockwell and Scott Bakula, you know, who A had incredible chemistry together, but mm -hmm. B would they made it they made the stories work. Um, he was such a good every man and every woman, mm -hmm. everybody, that it 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 was exciting. It was exciting to do. Oh, and one other thing about not letting him come home, I had written a trilogy, and at the end of the trilogy, well, in the, in the second part of the trilogy, Sam leaps in bed and creates a baby, and in the third part of the trilogy, we meet that baby, and Al says, she's in the future trying to bring you home. So I knew back then that I wanted him now to come back and mm. to have a daughter to go get him. That sounds like a reboot series. Sounds like a reboot to me. Come that on. Sounds, that, that, that sounds, take it to Peacock. We need that. <laughs> but it does actually, it because I've had a number of people, or, or, or I should say, I've had a number of questions from the audience, um, and I want to be respectful of, of your time. Or Do you have a, a, another couple minutes to Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because... Uh, Paul Rose Jr. keeps saying, uh, and here's just one of his comments about it, saying, seriously, dude, have her do the saga cell or tell the <laughs> saga cell. And I don't know what this means, but it sounds like something about your original selling of the show and your impression of what it would be, if that's, or one maybe I'm wrong. What happened when we first did the show was they couldn't figure out what it was. So... Brandon, again, who wanted people to understand what the show was about. Oh my gosh, I don't even know if I remember it. Um, we would open the show, it was actually my voice, um, theorizing that time travel, oh God, 
my memory is so bad these days. It basically talked about the whole premise, you know, the theory, the time travel, you know, that you could, which is quantum leaping. You could have two particles that could just exchange in that moment. Dr. Sam Beckett, oh, I wish I could do it. I can't do it. I can't remember it. I have to have it in front of me. Um, or I'd have to at least have practiced it once before I did it again. And the whole, and it ended with the fact that he walked in other people's shoes and that if he, if he helped enough people, that would be how he got home. So it played every week before the show. Not a thing. Tell him, tell Paul, I'm really sorry. I, Paul been, says, theorizing that time travel was possible within his own lifetime. That's right. If that's a prompt. Theorizing the time travel. No, that's not quite right. Theorizing the time travel within his own lifetime. Sam Beckett stepped into the accelerator and vanished. He leapt into lives that were not his own, seeing mirror images that were not his own. Making right what once went wrong. Oh no, and it, uh, it's out of order. It's coming back to me, but it's out of order. That God or time. Something. Facing mirror images that were not his own. That's all right. We don't have to. Oh man, sorry. Totally fine, uh, and uh, I will, I will, I will time jump uh, to. Well, I guess I'm not going to time jump. I was trying to figure out a way to shoehorn this into time travel language, but I actually have a question here from my my dad by way of my sister. I know that they're watching together, and that this comment is from her, but it's actually my dad uh, who says. Uh, if Deborah were to write a Quantum Leap episode today, where would you want Sam to go? Into the future. Hmm. So let us know that we got through this. Um, oh my God, somebody actually sent this to me. I, I, I want him to go into the future, which we could rarely, rarely do. All right, so I'm going to read this. Theorizing that one could travel... Theorizing that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett stamped into the quantum leap accelerator and vanished. He woke to find himself trapped in the past, facing mirror images that were not his own, and driven by unknown forces to change history for the better. His only guide on this journey is Al, an observer from his own lifetime, who appears in the form of a hologram that only Sam can see and hear. And so Dr. Beckett finds himself leaping from life to life, striving to put right what once went wrong and hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home. My brain just exploded. It's like <laughs> <laughs> in an alternate timeline, there's just bits of my brain splattered across the wall behind me. Thank you, Tasha, for that. Thank you, Tasha. That's amazing. And my sister, I'm sorry, I, my sister says it's false. It was she herself asking the question uh, of where she would have Sam leap. It was oh, ask her, dad. where would she have Sam go? Ask your sister. Well, she's watching, Lauren. Uh, type in and answer the question. Uh, where would you have Sam go? And you can, I know that there's my sister, her boyfriend, and my parents all watching together in the living room of my parents' house. So... You guys can discuss, and while you do, I have uh, a quick question, uh, Deborah, for you uh, that pertained to uh, to your your daughter. So Bruna in Brazil asks, "I've only watched the episode with Teresa, and it was great. How is it seeing your daughter acting at that age?" Teresa, some might know, has gone on to be at least somewhat successful. You might say. Yes. Um, subsequently as an actor but uh yeah what's it like having your daughter in your work when she's still very four. small four wow well i'll tell you an interesting story about that so i was working very very hard and i didn't get to see her and i thought well i'm gonna write an episode and Troy's gonna be in it so that she can come to work and visit and she can see what 
mom and dad do. And so she came in and we're on the set and it's the first day and I'm working with her on her lines and everything. And Dean Stockwell, who I don't know if you know or don't know, was a huge child star. I mean, I did not know that. Yeah, like in Elizabeth Taylor and all those child stars. Wow. He was a Broadway star at like five. So he walks in and he knows that, you know, he knows her because she's been on the set a couple of times before. And he sees that she's standing on the set in costume and they're doing her hair and doing everything else. And he goes, why is she here? And I went, oh, I, I wrote her an episode. I wanted to see what we do and come and hang out. And she, he goes, do you need the money? I went, what? He said, do you need the money? Because if you're going to take away her childhood for fun, you have to understand that you're taking away her childhood. And I went, oh, I mean, literally, he kind of backed me up against the wall. And I went, I never thought of it that way. And he said mm -hmm. that what I went through to support my family at five, six, seven, eight years old, I worked and I never had a child. And so she started to get offers immediately off that episode and i said nope 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 and Tony said but i want to do this and i went yes well when you're grown you can do this and in a way i'm glad i mean she was like the olsen twins lived across the street from us and we went out with them once to universal and i had i think it was Tony's birthday so i had like nine little girls and the olsen twins and we got we had a little private tram and we got there and i think she was six and we, we were sitting, eating in that little food court. And all of a sudden, I, I kind of looked out of the corner of my eye. And there's probably 30,000 people, it seemed like, surrounding us. Not that. 3,000. I mean, it was just like suddenly we were encircled because we had these two little girls who were huge stars at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what to do. I had never experienced anything like that. So I... I asked the driver of the tram, I said, could you do me a favor and call security? I don't, I don't imagine anybody's gonna hurt them, but I think we should leave now. And they came through with some people and kind of parted the seas of, of uh, you know, the security people and put us back on the tram and sent us on our way. And it was a real reality check as to that level of fame for somebody. And I have to say the girls, at that age were, you know, they were the nicest kids. They didn't care or know or understand. They were too young. Right, they did, they'd never experienced anything different. So Troy did a couple of jobs, um, you know, for dad. Cause he had a bunch of shows and stuff. And, um, and then she said she wanted to go and study uh, theater, which I supported a lot and she went off to um i remember we did a, a mom and daughter road trip because she got into a bunch of universities and she uh she chose uh to end up at usc which was a great experience for her and then literally she had barely graduated and she got a play at the geffen and they were in i think they were in rehearsal maybe Maybe the show had opened, um, Equivocation had opened, which is where she met Patrick, if I'm not mistaken. Patrick oh, she is, for those who don't know. Oh, Patrick uh, Adams, who is her husband, who was on Suits. Right. They did a play together called Equivocation at the theater. And um, and then she, she auditioned for uh, uh, Pretty Little Liars and got back. And then the rest is history. The rest is history. She blowed up. She yep. blowed up. And your son blowed up pretty big too. He's good. He's doing really good. He's uh, in Seattle creating technology uh, at Facebook. Um, you know, he's working on the portal, which, you know, I, I got to get one just so that I could be the next, the other generation that played with it. <laughs> right. I, I can report back to him. I'm sure that was it. But he's really, really smart. He's worked for a couple of companies. He's created some, you know, some apps, and and now he's at Facebook making stuff up. Mostly, he just goes, "I can't talk about it." So I go, "Yay, go team!" Whatever it is. 
That's the world of science, technology, politics. Everybody's working on stuff, and they go, but I can't talk about it. I know. It's like that. No, uh, I'm very, very blessed. I'm very blessed. I have good people in my life. My sisters and I are good friends. I'm sorry I've lost mom and dad. I have good friends and you know, in the industry and I'm developing new shows and writing movies and trying to tell stories. I wrote a bunch of books, the vision quest. Let's see if I have a book up here. Uh, uh -oh. where is it? Well, I'll be darned. And the age of Eve too. Oh, this is, there it is. This is a five part. Can you see that? No. Here we go. Oh, there we go. It's, this is uh, the vision quest. It's the Atlantean. Oh, there. It's a book series. It's a book series. Science fiction, Earth in the not too distant future, where after the great quakes of 2029, the world is, uh, let's see if I have the other ones. The world is, is reformed and we're unified as a planet. So it's not a dystopian um, society at first, but we get there. That's book, oh, that's book, no. There we go, that's book two. And then this is book four. So where's book three? Oh, the Odyssey that's is- all right. We can put links in the, in the description and in the chat. Um, but I love the idea of having something that isn't, it doesn't sound like overly dire for the future that isn't, you know. Well, it starts out pretty, ha I'll, I'll tell you very briefly. So we come back, we come together, um, an event happens where a virus, as a matter of fact, comes back from the moon and, and kills all our domestic pets. So people start genetically splicing other species together and they create all these alternate species. And then the species, somebody starts putting our genetics with these um, animals and fish and birds. And we start creating human-based alternate species. But the cool thing about it is their humanity is so new to them, they start to remember the powers that we've forgotten. Telekinesis and um, levitation and all these things that we have been told we can't do apparently we can and then the same scientists put our genetics into machines and the machines become sentient and once they become sentient they have all the knowledge of humanity and they look at us and they go these are terrible people we're going to take them out and then the, the whole story shifts so the story is told from the point of view of, of three friends coming of age and they've got to find their metaphysical powers, which are called the visionistic arts, before the machines build an army, and then they're gonna have to fight to save humanity. And this is a book series that you wrote yourself. Yes. This is not just something that you found and you're adapting, this is your vision. I wrote it, I wrote it. It was, uh, it's been a very, very long journey. So four of the five books are out and um, yeah, I, I'm very excited about it in the sense that it's a comment on a lot. It's a comment on our world. It's a comment on, you know, once the ultimate species comes in, racism shifts. We all, it's almost like we, as humans, have to have something to- Right, of course. To be angry at and to be hateful of. Um, but then once the machines come in, we realize that's the bigger common enemy. And I think the biggest message is, you know, don't let machines take away your humanity because your powers are in there. And maybe, they always say, you only use 10% of your brain, but what that other 90% is capable of doing, maybe if we put the phones down and start dealing with, um, with our brains, we'll find that we have our own superpowers. That's kind of the inspiration of the book. I love that. Um, and it's it's interesting to me, and I think that this I'll, I'll make my, my last question to you. Uh, what is it that you 
think draws you back to these science fiction frameworks and themes uh, and, and storylines time and again that because you, you've created, you know, one of the iconic sci-fi TV shows um, and done other work in genre, uh, what pulls you back into that space? What do you find appealing about it? You have to it? go back to the first sci-fi writer who, to me, was Mary Shelley when she wrote Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And it's the ability to look at the world that you live in and say, what if? And so people like Jules Verne, nobody thought about going to the moon until Jules Verne wrote, you know, uh, Journey, well, what was that, Man in the Moon or Journey to the Bottom of the Sea. People hadn't talked about that or considered it. So I truly believe science fiction writers are the inspiration to scientists to go, oh, I know how to do that. You know, you look at Star Trek and Gene Rodenberry and the fact that the, the little communicator looked a lot like the flip phones when they came out because somebody went, oh, that's a communicator. You could do that. You could put all that in, a, in your hand. It took a little bit to get there, but he saw that in the 60s. And then some, some scientist said, oh, wow, yeah, I didn't think about that. As a matter of fact, when I was writing the Vision Quest, I had a number of, of um, experts that I went out to research on. And I, I can't remember exactly what, what it was that I was talking about, but I called up one of the doctors and I said, you know, I've got this issue and I'm trying to, you know, put this together about nuclear fission or something. And I started to explain it to him. And he said, where did you come up with that? And I went, oh, I just, I just made that up. And he goes, I, I never thought of it that way. I'll have to call you back. So the mere fact that I didn't have that deep, meta, you know, physical science background mm -hmm. in quantum physics, um, I could think in, in a different, I wasn't with, restrained by what we're taught because my imagination says, well, what if, just make it up. So to, to, I think that answers the question. It, it opens the mind to the, and the imagination to, to see the world in a better way and to create it on the page. Because my hope in these books is maybe if we all start thinking this way, we can change the world we live in. I think that's the power of the human mind. We can change the world if we imagine it a better place, it will be a better place. And, and stop living under the thumb of fear, which is always thrown at us. Um, and, and, and the stress and the angst that we're under, if we just start saying, okay, this has got to change. And that, I think, is what's happening right now. Enough people are saying, time to change, time to change, time to change. You people are no longer of value because you're holding us back from being an evolving uh, into a better species. Yeah. So we need science fiction. I love that. And as somebody who on this show regularly uh, with guests who've written all kinds of things talks about how powerful and important I think science fiction is, I couldn't agree with you more and I couldn't say it better. Uh, I will add uh, that I do have a note back from my family back at home. And my dad says that if he could choose, per your question, he'd want Sam to have a reunion with the bartender. <laughs> and my sister adds, he also says he has goosebumps. So from the, from the reading and from uh, you doing it here with me. So, um, so thank you so much for, for coming on and for joining us. Uh, My honor. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't ask more. I talked too much. It was fun. I, uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful. This is one of my... I, I, I try not to say this too often because I want to always really mean it, but truly, this has been one of my favorite interviews that we've done. Uh, oh, so, so truly, thank you very, very much. <laughs> and, uh, and with that, I am uh, going to do a few closing words. And uh, I hope that you'll come back and join us on here again sometime. 
Uh, can I just say um, thank you to everybody and please come to thevisionquest.com. Um, I'm, I'm getting better at being a blogger person, but I'm not great. But if you go to, and you have to put in the, the visionquest.com, you can find out about the books. Cool. I think there's what a depth book and pratt.com. Is there so, an audio version with you reading it? You know, it's really funny. I just laid down the first two chapters. It's really hard. <laughs> I know. I have a friend that does it for a living. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, uh, that's great. I, so... And, and I just got a review back saying, oh, this is really good. And you did all these accents and voices. And so I had a good time. Um, so, yes, I just don't know. Okay. Well, I encourage everybody else to go and get the book immediately and start reading it. I'm an audio-driven person. And so I am definitely going to wait for the version that you read <laughs> because that'll be, that'll be fantastic. All right. I look forward. Cool. Thank you, Thank you so much again for coming on. Good night. Uh, good night. So that was our episode with the great Deborah Pratt. I feel like we could have talked for another few hours, and I hope that in the not-too-distant future we will. For now, uh, I am going to say a few thanks to our sponsors and then hype a very, very special episode that's coming up on Thursday. Um, before I get to that, I do want to say that today's episode was brought to you by Roadmap Writers and Notes for Execs. Roadmap Writers is an online writer education platform hosted by working industry executives. If you're looking for a real-world solution to help develop, market, and sell your script, visit RoadmapWriters.com to learn more. Notes for Execs is a company that guides working entertainment executives on how to give better and more effective creative notes. Now they're opening their doors to writers as well, who can learn a lot about their own writing through learning about the notes-giving process. Visit notesforexecs.com for more information. And please do come back on Thursday as uh, we will be hosting David Shore, creator of House and The Good Doctor, and uh, as far as I can tell, a very funny guy from uh, my email exchange with him earlier today. And uh, we will be airing at a special time to accommodate his schedule. We'll be on at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. So please do come back and check out David Shore and tell all your friends to come too. We are doing our best to get the word out about this, uh, this show as we, uh, as we ramp up into what we're calling Season 2. And uh, so please like, follow, share, subscribe, spread the word any way that you can. For now, thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. And we'll leave you with our closing credits. pandemic.